so for our last presenter, we have Jim Andrews, who is a coordinator of Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas. He is going to talk about the Moncton Amphibian Underpass. Thanks. I'm really excited about this underpass that has just completed. Those of you who have seen me here before are regular <clears throat> folks to VMC meetings probably know more about either statewide survey work that the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas does or intensive monitoring, say, in Mount Mansfield. We also do a lot of education and outreach, but I really want to focus on this little piece <clears throat> and the outcomes of this little piece, which is to locate and map significant road crossing areas, where those places are in the state. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> all of the vertebrates, reptiles and amphibians, are really the most sensitive to road mortality, and you get all kinds of gruesome examples there. <clears throat> and you might ask why that would be. Well, there's the obvious. They're slow, <clears throat> and they're little, and it takes them a long time to get across the road. If this was a, a bobcat crossing the road right there, or a fox or a coyote, they'd be across and maybe two seconds, but based on the camera results, the movie results that we have from our underpasses, these guys take on average about five or six minutes to get across the road. And in a period of five or six minutes, if you're on a fairly busy road, your chances of making it across the road go down pretty steeply. Now that's five or six minutes under the tunnel, and we don't have that same data for uh, when they're exposed. And my, my guess would be when they're exposed, they're actually traveling a little faster. But still, it's a, it's a long time, and it's a big distance for those little dudes. <laughs> uh, annual movement, <clears throat> as most of you know, most of these species have to migrate from their overwintering sites to a breeding site, <clears throat> and that might be uh, 100 yards up to four or 500 yards away. And so they require that annual movement out of their overwintering habitat to their forage or for their egg laying habitat and some of them actually spend a fair amount of time near the egg laying uh, habitat like blue spotted salmon just forage near the egg laying habitat and don't even move up back uphill to overwinter until the fall so they're down in that little and lot but the point is they got to move a couple times a year as adults and then of course the kids that are coming out of those pools they've got to move up uh, up drainage as well well, what else is going on that makes them sensitive? <clears throat> long lives, like Steve just mentioned, some of these creatures are long-lived species. Spring peepers, no, it's spring peeper, two or three years of drought, and you pretty much wipe them out because that's a short-lived uh, amphibian. But these guys, 20, 25 years, and when you have a species that um, <clears throat> has evolved to have that kind of a reproductive cycle, it's, it's based on the survival of the adults. And if the adults are not surviving, the population is going to disappear. Limited range, if you put a road through uh, uh, between a, <clears throat> a swamp and an upland, it might be taking up, let's say, 10% of the range, the road and its nearby impacts, 10% of the, of the total range of the amphibians in that population, whereas if you're looking at a deer or a, uh, a fox, that road is, is impacting a much smaller percentage of the population's range. So limited range is an important factor to consider too. And you put those all together, and as sad as it is to see a dead raccoon or skunk or <clears throat> deer, um, those are individual impacts on individual animals versus an impact on a whole population. And so when you have a road that's in the wrong, but you're, you're impacting a population rather than just a few individuals. Now with those larger mammals, of course, there's safety issues involved, particularly something like a moose or a deer, human safety issues and human safety costs. But as far as the wildlife is concerned, Reptiles and amphibians are the species that are most impacted, uh, the vertebrate species most impacted by roads. Well, so we know that they're getting killed all over the place. That snakes and frogs and salamanders are getting killed all over the roads. 
So we can't afford to put in underpasses, overpasses, trains in all those areas. So how do we determine what the significant crossing areas are where we might want to take some action? I came up with this list. <clears throat> I would consider a, a crossing area significant if it has rare threatened or endangered species, or where there's concentrations of con common species, like huge numbers, it's really generating a big population, or where there's a really wide diversity of species. And in some cases, like in Moncton, we got all three going on. Lastly, when does it become a conservation priority? Okay, it's significant, but when does it come a, become a conservation priority? Well, if the mortality is also high. We've got some crossing areas that are very significant, but like in my hometown in Salisbury, it's a little dirt road, and it sees maybe a car or two an hour. They can handle it. You know, that, that's some mortality, but the population can handle it. But where <clears throat> the mortality gets very, very high, populations disappear. And that's been pretty well documented. Uh, James Gibbs' work in New York State has shown that pretty well. So <clears throat> when we're looking for these areas, Google Earth is just a, a great tool. You know, you can go fly around and see where there ought to be significant crossing areas. In terms of numbers, <clears throat> I'm convinced that, that most of the significant crossing areas are going to be places where instead of an isolated vernal pool, you really have a large wetland complex like this. This is the Heisinger Swamp. This is the Moncton Virgins Road where this crossing is. I don't know if you know where uh, Moncton Pond is up here, Moncton Ridge is up here, the Moncton Elementary School is up here, and if you work your way this way, you're going to end up in Virgins. This is a town road, not a state road or a federal road, so this was a town project. So think about that a little bit, working with your select board to put in amphibian underpasses. You know, that's a pretty impressive piece of work. <laughs> um, but it shows up a little bit better when you actually can look at a, a good old fashioned topo map and you can see the swamp. You can see essentially what the edge of the swamp is working like <clears throat> is hundreds of vernal pools rather than just one or two vernal pools. All along the edge of this thing, we're talking about hundreds of vernal pools. Here's the overwintering habitat. And here's the road that has become busier and busier, particularly of late, because it is the way to get from Virgins to Williston Four Corners. So Tap Four Corners, that whole area. And so this has become busier and busier over recent years. Now, <clears throat> Amphibians are crossing, you know, anywhere from about here down to here to get up into these forested uplands to overwinter. But that would be a very, very expensive project to cover that entire area with underpasses. Our initial plan looked at that and uh, suggested eight underpasses. That would have been more expensive than, than what the local folks felt they could, they could raise to put in underpasses. So concentrate then on this area down here where the Heisinga Swamp, named after the local farmers here, the Heisinga Swamp is right next to the uplands. You just got swamp, road, upland. Here you've got some uplands on the downhill side of the road. So you've got some overwintering habitat all up in here and hopefully we don't know, but hopefully there's a lot of overwintering going on up in here and up in here too, mm -hmm. but no roads, so that's not as much of a concern. By the way, the pipeline is going through that swamp too, the gas pipeline. Uh, <clears throat> so, significant, well, the first category, rare, threatened, or endangered species. In this case, the rarest one we have there is blue spotted, which is really a Champlain, primarily a Champlain basin species, a lowland species. In any case, lots of blue spotted salamanders crossing here. Second criteria numbers, concentrations of common species. So 2009, and these numbers, by the way, are coming from monitoring prior to the underpasses that was organized by residents of the town. So 
Fortunately, on this Moncton Conservation Commission, there was Steve Perrin, the non-game biologist for Fish and Wildlife, and uh, Chris <coughs> Slaysar, who is the environmental wildlife guy for VTrans, and also fortunately nearby was the Lewis Creek Association, which had a real interest in this. And so they were monitoring, they were getting some preliminary data, which you need. What's going on and where are they actually crossing? How many? Um, where are the concentrated crossing areas? And that's what they were getting for us. And wide diversity, huge list of species that were crossing there, huge list of species, all crossing in that same area. So, <clears throat> of the known sites, of the known significant sites, this one clearly had the highest mortality. And these two nights, the estimate was about 1,000 mortalities, two spring nights. Compared to, and this is looking at our Morgan Road crossing site at Salisbury, which really has more amphibians and some rarer amphibians, mm -hmm. but 10, you know, over four nights, you know, an occasional car goes through. Um, there would be more mortality than that. These are minimal sorts of levels, but clearly there was a lot of mortality there, and our thinking was that the populations would not be able to sustain that. And again, re referring to the studies in New York State, entire populations have disappeared next to busy roads. And depending on what kind of species you're talking about, further and further away from those roads. So, <clears throat> it's kind of a basic timeline. I, I cut out some stuff, but we first found that site in 1993, and that was Herp Atlas data, the one in the Herp Atlas. Um, and then 1997, Moncton Conservation Commission started paying attention and monitoring the site. 2005, Moncton Conservation Commission begins studying migration options, mitigation, sorry, mitigation options. 2008, Moncton Conservation Commission and the Lewis Creek Association begin raising funds. And once again, keep in mind, town road. And, and to me, that's a big deal that the town did this. This was not feds or, or, or state money. And then, 2015, we have a contract with SD Ireland. So, <laughs> some of the local members were pretty enthusiastic about getting the, uh, the project started. You could see that <clears throat> although we have limited places where the amphibians could really go onto the roads, we needed to have barriers that directed the amphibians. And, and my concern was that there was not going to be a lot of maintenance concerns for the local road people. I thought that would be a real hassle if that happened. So I wanted barriers that were going to last. These are uh, six foot by two foot by two foot concrete blocks that intersect. And so, and there's drainage underneath uh, put in ahead of time. You can see where they connect and how they connect. And the drainage is all set up, drainage coming from behind them. Um, Again, you can just get pictures of the drainage, how it's set up, how it's essentially about uh, 225 feet of walls matched on both sides, but we had more wall on the lower side just because it was less expensive to put there and we wanted to maximize wall. So we were actually catching more stuff coming out and directing it underneath the, the, uh, the tunnels than, than from the top side. And then here you can see what the culverts look like. We wanted both air, these are five feet wide, and we wanted both air and moisture to get in from the road. And so we have this big manhole cover, sorry, um, on the top. And for those that go in the wrong direction, we want to turn them around. <laughs> and, it, and, you know, to me that was kind of a nice afterthought. I didn't know whether it was really going to work, but it does seem to work, okay? We also wanted to seal the spaces, expanding foam. And I wanted to make sure, and, and in this case, when I'm saying I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting on another hat as, as the herpetological consultant for the design here. I wanted to have native soil in there, and I wanted to have native leaves in the bottom. And so that's what's being brought, is a bag of leaves being brought in. Here's the manhole covers. Here's the final look 
Um, these walls in most places are two feet tall, but in some places you can see they're much taller. So this wasn't, uh, this wasn't cheap. And so there were a group of people raising money and uh, some grants, some individuals, um, a couple more grants. Transportation enhancement, by the way, that doesn't pay for roads. Some people were concerned that we were taking money away from bridges or road construction. It pays for things like bike paths or um, flower gardens um, near roads. And so we, we got some Fed money for that State Wildlife Grant to Town, Lewis Creek Association, direct mail. Some people gave as much as $5,000 a piece. I was amazed at some of the donations. And an Indiegogo fundraising campaign that did the last of it. So a lot of money was invested. I wanted it to work, and so did everybody else. And so we had cameras in there taking pictures every minute in the spring, at night, and just in that time period, we had 2,280 amphibian crossings going through those culverts. And just a steady stream of amphibians and I found it uh, as a visual um, educational outreach tool so there was many like 50 amphibians moving through that that culvert at one time just a huge stream going through but there was some other cool stuff too that you could see going through <laughs> So thank you.